Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I get to serve on staff here and with our eighth grade girls on Wednesday evenings. I'm going to be reading um, part of our text today. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And this is the word of the Lord. In 1860, a man was born by the name of C.T. Studd, and he was born into a life of wealth and affluence, a very prominent family, and C.T. Studd would go on to become uh, what was the forerunner of the super athlete of today. Uh, C.T. Studd played cricket, and despite the fact that we might not care about it, uh, it was a big-time sport in in his day. Uh, He was the Tom Brady uh, or the Michael Jordan of cricket, uh, very widely known and celebrated for his cricket-playing abilities. He would ultimately wind up at Cambridge, where he would study, uh, continue his career, and the expectation that everyone had of the life of C.T. Studd is that he would go on uh, to even greater fame and wealth as a result of his cricket playing abilities. And yet, um, when Studd graduated from Cambridge, he didn't continue playing cricket at all. Uh, He'd come to faith in Jesus Christ as a young man And rather than pursuing the fame and fortune um, afforded him by his abilities, he decided that he was going to give his life to missions. And so C.T. Studd, really, he began to go labor in obscurity. He served alongside a man by the name of Hudson Taylor at the China Inland Mission and and began to share the gospel and serve in orphanages in China and would go on. He would serve later in India and then in Africa. But as a man who was so well known and so prominent and had been written about in newspapers and, and things such as that, he would often get the question, why in the world did you give your life to serving orphans in a country? And, you know, they don't speak your language and you're, you're serving in, in obscurity when you could have gone on to such uh, fame and fortune. And C.T. Studd actually wrote a poem that explains this very thing. Uh, the refrain of the poem, it's repeated over and over and over. He wrote these words, it says, Only one life, it will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ Will last. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. In the estimation of C.T. Studd, he didn't waste his life. He didn't squander his opportunity for fame and fortune. He made the greatest possible use of his life that he could, and that was life in service in building the kingdom of God. Uh, today, as we look back into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to talk to you about how not to waste your life. How do we avoid spending our lives on things that don't matter and instead in Invest our lives in the things that do. Now, if, if you weren't here with us last week, we jumped way ahead in our series in 1 Corinthians to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. After all, it was Easter. We're going to talk about the resurrection. But when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he didn't write it so that, you know, pastors 2,000 years later could have a really great Easter sermon. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to correct correct some rather dramatic errors that the church at Corinth uh, was making with regard to the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Many in the church at Corinth believed that there was no such thing as a bodily resurrection, and they were living their lives as if that was true. And so uh, as they would go about their day not believing that God had ushered in a new kingdom and a greater kingdom, a lasting and eternal kingdom that was greater than what they could uh, ultimately live here on this earth, um, they were living as if this life was all that there was. And listen, if this life is all that there is, might as well make it count, right? Might as well live it up. I mean, you know, go and enjoy, indulge your flesh. I mean, whatever you need to do, if this life is all that there is, then I would say the best use of your life is to just make it, make it count for all that you got, right? You just give it everything you have and make it count. But if this life is not all that there is, and if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, 
And if this short life, these few years we get to spend here, are merely the prelude to an eternity spent in heaven with God, in fullness of joy, where there's no more sickness or suffering or pain or heartache, but fullness of joy face to face with the God of the universe, if this life is merely the prelude to that, then I would argue that we should be careful how we spend these next few years. And as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, correcting their misunderstandings about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he gave them all sorts of evidences. We talked about it last week. He, to the Corinthians, he said, you know, if you don't believe what I told you about the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, he's like, hey, go talk to Peter. You can go talk to the 12 apostles who were all eyewitnesses. As a matter of fact, there are 500 people who saw the risen Christ all at the same time. Most of them are still alive. You can go and talk to them and verify that what I'm telling you is true. So if that's still not enough, go talk to James. And if that's not enough, you can talk to me. You see, the apostle Paul had seen the risen Christ, and it dramatically reshaped his life such that he gave his life to furthering the gospel, to preaching the gospel to the Gentiles in difficult places where he was often persecuted. Now, where we're going to pick up in chapter 15, um, Paul is about to issue a very stern rebuke to the believers, those who called themselves Christians at Corinth. And I I, I would hate uh, to ever receive a rebuke this stern from an apostle in my own life. But if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 34. Now again, he's spoken to the validity of the resurrection. And then in verse 34 of chapter 15, he says this. He says, wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right. And do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. Wake up from your drunken stupor. Now, it's got to be rough if you think that you're killing it and you're living for the Lord, right? You're just rolling along in your faith and life is good. And then you get a word from an apostle, like the Apostle Paul, the one who'd initially founded the church at Corinth, the one who preached the gospel there. He taught there for 18 months. And he's like, hey, not only are you not on the right course, you're like in a drunken stupor. You are in a place where you're acting like you have no knowledge of God. You are ignorant of his ways and you are living utterly sinful lives. This is not something you would take lightly. This is a very firm rebuke. And I don't know what the Apostle Paul might write to us. I don't know exactly what his words might be. But I do think there's something here for us to learn with regard to how we spend our lives, to how not to waste our lives while we're here on this earth. And so the Apostle Paul is going to point out two key things uh, that we need to know about our faith. The first is this. Our beliefs shape our behaviors. What we believe will ultimately shape what we do. It was true of the church at Corinth. Uh, For those who believe that there was no such thing as a bodily resurrection, um, but rather that maybe the afterlife was just kind of some spiritual essence where you might go to some sort of heavenly place and your your soul just kind of hangs out there. Because some people believe that, they were. And they were living it up in this life. They were giving it all that they had. They had come to this erroneous belief that somehow what we experience in this life is the pinnacle of living. That, that, that this life, we only have one opportunity, we might as well go get it. The Apostle Paul is like, no, 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 listen. Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead in bodily form, man, he was just the first fruits. It's going to happen for us as well. We're going to spend eternity in heaven with the risen Christ. We're going to be ruling and reigning. This life doesn't hold a candle to what's going to happen there. But because the Corinthians believed, there's no such thing as a resurrection. There's no bodily resurrection. This life is all that there was. They were caught up in all manner of sin. Idolatry and greed, sexual immorality that will make you blush. We're going to get there, y'all. I'll try to warn you before we talk about it in Corinthians. I mean, they were living it up. Our beliefs shape our behaviors in profound ways. And for you and for me, We need to understand this point. As believers in Jesus Christ, a couple of thousand years later, we would be foolish to not understand that this was true for us as well. 
See, for whatever reason, these Corinthians, they hadn't deepened in their knowledge and their understanding of who God was. They were still ignorant of Him. And as a result, they'd been led astray by these false teachings and these false teachers. And it led them into a life of sin that would ultimately lead to their destruction. You know, the same could be true of us. I don't know if you've heard this. I've heard it since I've been in ministry. Many, many Christians and believers who are like, hey, you know, I love Jesus. Man, I'm all in for God, but I'm, you know, I'm not a reader. I don't really study the scriptures much. It's hard to understand. And so, you know, I mean, I, I just love Jesus and love people. Just kind of go throughout my life. You know what I mean? No big deal. I love Jesus and I love his church, but I... You know, I'm, I don't really get into doctrine or theology. I don't really think it's all that important for us. People just fuss over things that they shouldn't. For many of us, we spend our entire lives like splashing around in the kiddie pool of Christianity rather than coming to know the God of the universe, the God who created all that we know and see, and the God who has given us His Word that we might know Him. And for those of us whom it might be difficult to understand the Scriptures, God has given us His Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He has sent His Spirit to live in us that we might know Him and have a relationship with Him and follow Him with our whole hearts. Let me ask you a question. If you were beginning a dating relationship with somebody and they just profess their love for you, man, I, I love them so much. I love her so much. I mean, I think she's just amazing. I want to give, I want to spend my life with her or him or whoever, whatever it might be for you. Um, and yet that person would say in the same breath, listen, I, I really, really love him, but I'm really not that interested in getting to know him. You know, I mean, I, I really love him, but I don't really care, you know, who you are. I don't need to know your heart or your character or your thoughts or desires. I'm really not all that interested. I really love them, but I'm not interested in getting to know them. And most of us would tell them to hit the road, right? Like, you're, that's foolish. Like, if you don't want to know me, you don't really love me. Like, if you're not interested in me as a person, you're not really interested in me at all. And I wonder if it might be an accusation against us that we're far more interested in what God has to offer us than we are in God himself. Rather than getting to know the God of the universe, many of us, we spend our whole lives splashing around in the kiddie pool of Christianity, just living it up unaware that there are deeper waters, deeper things to know about who God is, about His nature and His character, things that we can come to understand and know about Him. And it's really important because our beliefs shape our behaviors. And if we don't believe the right things, we likely won't behave the right way. It was true of the Corinthians. And it'll be true of us if we're not careful. Now, what the Apostle Paul does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is he contrasts his beliefs and behaviors with those of the believers at Corinth. Look up with me in verse 30. And he asks them the question. He's like, hey, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. Apostle Paul's like, hey, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, trained under Gamaliel. I gave it all up in pursuit of the gospel. I have seen the risen Christ and it has profoundly transformed my life. As a matter of fact, I put myself in harm's way every single day to take the gospel to people that need to hear it. I'm offering myself in service to Jesus Christ. He's going to go on to talk about fighting wild beasts at Ephesus, which most people would suggest is really a reference to the persecution that he served there. But the Apostle Paul would ultimately he would be persecuted and imprisoned and beaten and ultimately killed for his faith in Jesus Christ. And he's like, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, I mean, if eternity doesn't hang in the balance, if every person isn't ultimately going to spend eternity in a place called heaven or hell, and only those who come to faith in Jesus Christ will spend eternity with Jesus, why am I doing this? And then he points out, what many of them had been doing. It's rebuke both from an Old Testament prophet and something that their culture would have understood widely. He said, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Man, if I believe that Jesus hadn't been, been raised from the dead, I would just live it up just like you are. 
but he's offering them a rebuke and he's giving them firm evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because our beliefs shape our behaviors. And this is critical that we know the right things about God. We come to understand who he is and that our, our beliefs have depth to them, that we might ultimately stand on those things. Now, the second thing that I want to point out here that the Apostle Paul assumes. First, our beliefs shape our behaviors. The second is that our company shapes our character. He's going to say that here in verse 33. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Our company shapes our character. There were some in the church at Corinth who had likely been going out and really just pursuing pleasure. And, and if you were a good Greek and you wanted to have a good time, I don't, I don't necessarily get this, uh, but you would go maybe out into the marketplace or, or you would go out to the, the amphitheaters and you would listen to the philosophers and they would you know, spread these ideas. And one of the, the ideas of Greek philosophy, you'll see this in Plato, is that the material world is inherently sinful and that the spiritual world is the realm of good. And so their idea was that there's no way these mortal physical bodies will ever be with us in heaven. And not only that, there's no way that we could ever live righteous lives in these utterly uh, evil bodies. And so we might as well not fight it. It was this errant philosophy that they had received while probably just pursuing some entertainment that had seeped into their lives. They'd given an audience to these Greek philosophers who didn't have knowledge of God, who didn't know who he was or what was true about the world, and it had begun to impact their lives. Listen, y'all, the same is true for us. There were no Corinthian believers that were like, you know what, I think I want to be misled today. You know, I'd like to hear some, some really awful ideas that I could adopt that will lead me into a, a sinful and destructive lifestyle. I think I'd really like to do that. No, y'all, it was subtle. It's kind of akin to what happens if you go outside in the winter when it's icy outside and you're not paying attention. Right? No one falls flat on their face because they think it's fun. It's, it happens because we're not paying attention, because we don't realize how slick it is outside, right? That's how we fall into error. And in the same way that maybe they were just pursuing a little bit of entertainment, and without realizing it, they became an audience to false teachers, Y'all, we could spend a lot of time talking about the internet, right? Our smartphone that we spend hours a day. And while we probably wouldn't invite people to come into our home and teach us and our kids their wild philosophies about the world, we do that very thing. We do it with YouTube. We do it with Facebook or social media or the people that we give an audience and a voice to. Apostle Paul is like, man, ignorant of God. And it's to your shame. They had been misled. They'd fallen into the seat because they didn't keep this in their vision and their understanding that right beliefs will ultimately lead to right behaviors, wrong beliefs would lead to wrong behaviors, and that our, our company would shape our character. They weren't being careful with how they were living. So what happens in the next several verses, the Apostle Paul, he's just laying out the truth of the resurrection about what our bodies are going to look like. He's like, man, you right now, you've got a perishable body, but it's going to be raised imperishable. Like right now, it's really physical, but you're going to experience uh, spiritual realities with God in the, in the, when Jesus comes, a new heaven, a new earth. You're going to have, you're going to be completely transformed. You're going to have a perfect body, a glorified body before God. And he kind of lays out all all of the understandings about what it will look like for us when we're resurrected with Christ. But then at the end of everything that he has to say comes the word therefore. His summary statement that he wants the Corinthians to understand in regard to everything that he's just told them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, about the gospel that he clarified. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Rather than men and women who flail about in ignorance of the things of God, who give ourselves to sin in this life, he's like, man, we need to come to know what is true. We need to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so today I want to tell you just two ways 
to avoid wasting your life and instead to use your life in a, in a way that's not in vain, but ultimately that you know that your labor might be fruitful in this life to make your life count. Number one, the Apostle Paul says that we need to know and stand on the truth. We need to know and stand on If our life is going to matter, if we're going to avoid wasting our life being deceived, laboring in obscurity, obscurity believing uh, mistruths that would lead to our destruction rather than knowing truth that will lead to our salvation, we need to know and stand on the truth. Now, these two words that he uses here in 58 when he says, be steadfast and immovable, they're synonyms. He's really just repeating the same thing twice because he wants us to get it. Um, sometimes I miss it the first time around, but uh, he repeats it. And so the idea is, is that you would establish what is true. He's like, hey, be steadfast. Get your feet on solid ground. Come to understand what is true and right, what is true about God himself. And then no matter what, you don't let anyone move you from that. And you get ready to fight. You know that it's coming, that there are currents of culture that are going to press against you that they're going to try to move you from where you stand. They're going to lead you into error. You've got to be careful and diligent about this thing. He's telling them to get out of the kiddie pool of Christianity. To begin to swim in the depths of who God is. To get to know His nature and character. To know who God truly is. So that you're not so easily going to fall prey to deception. Man, I want to speak to you for a minute. And God has called us, despite what our culture might tell us at times, God has seen fit that we've been called to be leaders in our homes and in our community. If we don't know the word, who will? I read an article a couple of weeks ago about how it's not just young people who are abandoning uh, biblical morals, but rather... Adults, 40, 50, 60 years old, are walking away from clearly taught biblical morality. And as they surveyed them about what had led these adults astray, I mean, 40, 50, 60 year olds, right? What had led them astray? You know, they didn't say that it was some great philosopher or teacher. It wasn't their pastor who stood up on a stage. It wasn't a politician. Do you know who was leading them astray? It was their kids. Who, by spending an hour on the internet listening to a false teacher, were able to come home and sway mom and dad from biblically held truths that they clung to for their entire lives. And it's a sad indictment on the Christian home. So, man, I want to invite you dive into the Word of God, as difficult as it may be for you. And you, you begin to, well, at first you flail a little. Y'all remember learning to swim? Right? You got to take the floaty off, and then you're out there and, and you're, you're kind of splashing around and you look kind of foolish. And it feels a little bit foolish, right? But after a while, you get a feel for the water. And you learn not, how, not only how to stay afloat, but you learn how to move a little bit. And before long, you pick up steam and you learn how to swim, swim and guide through the water. And you can have a, a great deal of joy in that. And as we dive into the Word as men, we start with the simple gospel truths. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. He was raised, and on, the, the, uh, raised on the third day. That's what we, we start with. It's the simple gospel truth. But then we come to know, what does the Scripture teach about how I should lead my family? About what it looks like to be a godly man or a godly woman? How should I conduct myself in business? And we ask over and over and over again, what does the Word of God have to say about that? And if we don't have the answers, we turn to people in our lives to help us find those things. The Apostle Paul says you need to know and to stand on the truth. It needs to be in you that nothing might move you. Then he goes on. Tells us we're not supposed to be egg-headed, right? We're not supposed to just know a lot about the Bible. But he goes on and tells us that we should always be abounding in the work of the Lord. That we got to get busy. That we need to be about this work of God. That the gospel is a life or death message that really does matter for eternity. We ask, well, when are we supposed to do this? Work for the Lord. When are we supposed to live out the work of the Lord? That's the second point. We've got to live the truth. Apostle Paul says, always. Every moment of every day, the Apostle Paul is like, every hour I'm in danger. Every day I die. 
We get up every morning, we offer ourselves in service to the Lord, always abounding in the work. How much should we do? Well, his definition here, the word he gives us is abounding. That means overflowing. That in every moment, in every situation, we're abounding in the work of the Lord, offering ourselves in service to him. And why do we do it? Because it's fruitful. He tells us that it's never in vain. Our work in the Lord is never in vain. How do we avoid wasting our lives? We know and stand on the truth, and we live it out in our lives. Some of you have known truth only at an intellectual level. You're raised in Sunday school. You got a button. You won the sword drill, scripture memory, but you never lived it out in your life. Church, there's a reason that we, we harp on the six practices of a disciple here, and we tell you over and over and over again, we want you to devote yourselves daily. Where you get up in the morning or you stay up late at night and you open the word of God, And by the power of your spirit, you seek to know it and to surrender your life to it. You walk with God in prayer throughout the day, devoting yourself daily. And then you gather here consistently with the church of God to be taught from the word, to be encouraged uh, by the body. You commit yourself to community, a group of people that you would invite into your life that they might even have to speak words like Paul spoke to the Corinthians. Wake up from your drunken stupor. Hey, you're falling into sin In community, we have a group of people who are as committed to us following Jesus as we are, right? They're going to fight alongside of us, walking with us. But that's not enough. We don't want to become some inward-focused little holy huddle of a church. We get out and we abound in the work of the Lord. We serve faithfully and we give sacrificially. And we engage missionally in the world that God has called us to. We have one opportunity to live for Christ. C.T. Studd said it this way, Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. How do we avoid wasting our lives? We know and we stand on the truth, and we live it out each and every day. Would you bow with me? Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what sometimes is delivered as a, a really stern rebuke. Father, I pray that we would take this to heart and that you would make us a people who know you deeply, who know and stand upon your word and your truth in the midst of a culture that has lost sight of what truth is. But God, the church is the hope of the world. If we don't stand on truth, who will? So God, may you empower us to know it and to live it and to stand firm even when things get difficult. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.